Well, good morning. On Friday night, I had the privilege of supporting our youth leaders um, by being a taxi driver for part of the program where they went up to do ice blocking and they had a fabulous time. But I was just struck by how um, beautiful and how much young children or young, young people can teach us about prayer. And I was struck by it because um, it just came up in conversation about what has just, just unfolded in Christchurch, New Zealand over the weekend. And many of us have really had heavy hearts as we hear about this because we remember back to a really dark day in Australian history when uh, a crazy man walked into Port Arthur and, and just think about the, the devastation on individual lives and on uh, people who were just gathering to peacefully worship in the way that they chose to, <laughs> whether you agree with that or not, but just personally chose to, to meet and gather peacefully and uh, were brutally gunned down. And so uh, just hearing some of the prayers from the young people, as I said, well, I've got to keep my eyes on the road. <laughs> but if let's pray. How about we pray? And they're like, yeah. And just to hear the sincerity of their prayers, praying for the individuals, praying for God to somehow bring good, praying for people to see Jesus was just, uh, it was, it's a holy moment actually. And uh, I just thought, let's start this morning's message by just praying, hey? Why don't we stand together? Praying for God's grace and goodness and his gospel to just go out into that immensely hurting situation and actually the nation of New Zealand, which are really feeling it now, and particularly even as the, the nationality of the gunman was an Australian-born man. Let's just pray into that, that God would help Christians to rise up and minister there, but also that his peace and his, his message would go out. Why don't we pray? Father, we just thank you that you know exactly what happened and you know exactly what's going on in the hearts and lives of people, the immediate families that are affected. Lord, the city of Christchurch, our sister city, in the nation of New Zealand, Lord, you know exactly what's going on in the hearts and minds of people. And so we bring this situation before you. We sometimes don't know what to pray, Father. But we ask that you would move, that you would point people to Jesus, that the church would rise up and be a place, not of judgment, but of hope and humility and compassion and mercy, where the good news would go out, that you are a God who grieves with us, who mourns with us. And Lord, we pray that there would be justice in this situation. And Lord, we thank you that your amazing grace, where sin abounds, your grace overflows and abounds even more. So we pray that somehow the message of Jesus, the hope that we have in him, would permeate so many hearts in this nation, that hearts would be turned toward you, and that people would find you and meet you. And so we thank you for your comfort. We thank you that you are still in charge. We pray for the leader of uh, the nation of New Zealand, Jacinda. We pray for her cabinet, for the government. Lord, that you would give them wisdom in how to bring hope and, and reconciliation. Speak words that are going to give hope. And, and even if there's laws that need to change, Lord, we pray that justice would be done. In your mighty name. Amen. Why don't we take our seats? Do you know, prayer is an amazing gift to be able to commune with God, to be able to relate to God, to be able to talk with Him. And prayer is so much more than one dimensional. It's more than a shopping list. It's more than a one-sided transaction. <laughs> it's not just logging in to tell God your needs and upload your prayer requests and log out and then I'll manage the rest of my life. Thank you very much. 
Prayer is so much more than just one dimensional. And how we view God, who he is, what he's like and how he acts impacts upon every aspect of our lives, including how we pray. And so today we're uh, jumping into week three of our 40 days of prayer campaign, kicking off with this message. And uh, I want to start just by sharing that God is a multi-dimensional God. We see it in creation. <laughs> Because you can learn a lot about God just by looking at his creation. I mean, if I went for a walk down a hill and I saw a random rock, you know, that was out of place or the wrong colour for the region where I was walking, you could think that would be an accident. But if I walked down the road and I'd never seen an iPhone before and I suddenly, there was just an iPhone sitting along the side of the road, you know, and, and, and... Would that be an accident? No. Someone actually had to think up. This didn't just form by itself. It didn't just put itself together and design itself and start working all by itself. Okay, there was a designer that put this phone together. And design is evidence of a designer. Our creation is evidence of a designer. There's order, there's creativity, there's purpose, there's intricate detail. It's so powerful to see that. In a billion, trillion years, they could go past, but an iPhone would never pull all the different components of itself together and start working by itself. It just wouldn't happen. (laughs) What about the complexity of design in a baby? Have you ever seen the birth of a baby? Maybe you haven't. But how a woman's body works to give birth to a baby. It's amazing. What about a child taking its first breath? Have you ever considered how a baby comes together from a simple single cell and a zygote and then becomes you? I mean, that's evidence of design. That's evidence of complexity. That's evidence of God's creation. Creation itself declares that God is creative and God is great and God is powerful. In Romans 1.20 it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So people are without excuse. Do you know that means we don't have the excuse of ignorance when it comes to the reality of God's existence, just because of creation. Just because it is so abundantly clear and obvious that there is intent and design. And you might think about the Big Bang and think, I I think that could happen. Well, who caused the Big Bang? (laughs) There had to be someone who caused it to happen, if that's what you believe. Like this, this improbability of randomness in our universe when it comes to creation. All of this points to the fact that there is a God. In Job 11, verse 7 to 9, it says, Can you fathom the limits and bounds of the greatness and the power of God? The sky is no limit for God, but it lies beyond your reach. God knows the world of the dead, but you do not know it. In other words, there's a whole realm, there's a whole dimension you don't even know about, but God knows about it. God's greatness is broader than the earth and wider than the sea. God is a multi-dimensional God and creation shouts it, (laughs) declares it, (laughs) overwhelmingly so. We also see the fact that God is a multi-dimensional God when we look at Jesus' incarnation. God chose to enter humanity at a certain time and space in history, even though he is beyond time and space. In John 1.4, it says, The Word became a human being and lived among us. In other words, when God came to earth and became a human being, he became flesh. He became one of us. (laughs) It goes on to say, we saw his glory, the glory that belongs to the only son of the father. And he was full of grace and truth. 
The fact that God can be God and that he can come to earth and be a human means he's multi-dimensional. He's multi-dimensional. And the Bible says this about Jesus in Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Do you know anybody else like that? You're not the same as you were yesterday or last week. (laughs) Neither am I. You've got a few less hairs and a few more wrinkles. Come on, let's be honest. (laughs) But Jesus, God in human form, is the same yesterday, today and forever. That's amazing. Jesus is God and he is multidimensional. So we see it in creation, we see it in Jesus' incarnation. We see that God is a multidimensional God in how the Holy Spirit moves. In John 3 verse 8, Jesus is talking and he says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you don't know where the wind comes from or where it's going. That's the way it is with everyone born of the Holy Spirit. And it's like Jesus is saying, you can't put the Holy Spirit in a box. (laughs) You can't control him. He's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. You can hear the sound. You can see the impact of what he does. You can see the evidence that he's been moving. But the Holy Spirit moves in dimensions that we don't move in. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, who is just like Jesus, is multi-dimensional. So God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are all multi-dimensional. And you might be thinking, why are you talking about that? We're talking about prayer. What is the point of talking about this? Because how you view God affects everything, including how do you pray? And if God is multi-dimensional, then it means that I am never ever, ever alone. Never, and neither are you. (laughs) He's in the past. God is in every dimension at the same time. He's in the past, he's in the present, he's in the future. He's here, he's there. He's in heaven, he's on earth. He's in the spirit world, he's in your and my world. He's in every dimension all the time, all at the same time. He's above you. He's around you because he's multidimensional. And if you know Christ, he's in you. You are never alone because God is omnipresent. He is multidimensional. He is everywhere all at the same time. That is good news. Knowing and understanding that is such an encouragement. Because God is multidimensional. And we're not talking about a bunch of gods. We're talking about the one and only God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But because He is multidimensional, David the psalmist says it so well. He says, I'm never alone. (laughs) I'm never alone. God, you are always with me. In Psalm 139, it says this, Where could I go to escape from you, God? Where could I ever get away from your presence? If I went up to heaven, you'd be there. If I lay down in the world of the dead, you'd be there. If I flew way beyond the east or lived the farthest place to the west, you'd be there too to lead me. You'd be there too to help me. God is everywhere. He is the beginning and the end. He was, He is, and He is to come. The Bible tells us so clearly. This means there's no place you've been, there's no place you are now, there's no place you're going to be that God is not going to be there with you. That is for some of you here this morning. That is your take home. It's like, man, I can walk into my future with confidence. I can walk into what God has for me without fear because I know that He's going to be with me. Because you cannot go to a place in your future where God is not. You cannot go through a situation that's going to come, a catastrophe, a crisis, something that's going to happen in your future where God is not. And so you can go confident because He is with you. He already goes before you. He's already there. 
waiting for you. How good is that? And I just believe that truth for some of you is like setting you free. (laughs) As you think on it this week, as you meditate on it, there's freedom from fear. There's freedom from discouragement. There's freedom from shame. There's freedom from feeling like you have to control the future. Because God is with you. It's freedom from rejection. There's freedom from the pain of abandonment or betrayal. And I just felt that some of you particularly, that's for you this morning. There's been abandonment. There's been betrayal. There's been people who have let you down. But God knows that and he will never let you down. And he will continue to heal your heart and walk with you into your future. Since God is everywhere and in every dimension, you can talk to him about every dimension of your life. Because he... So when we pray, although we cannot see God with our physical eyes, we can reach out to him and draw near to him knowing he already knows and understands. In Ephesians 1, the Apostle Paul prays that our faith capacity, our faith eyes the ability to reach out to God, trusting that he hears and responds to us. He prays that these faith eyes will be enlightened, will be flooded with light by the Holy Spirit. Why? So that the Holy Spirit can help us keep getting to know Jesus better. So the Holy Spirit can help us grow confident about the hope we have in him. So the Holy Spirit can help us continually experience his presence and his power. And so I want us to use these faith eyes today because I want to talk about a way to pray that's perhaps going to freshen up some of us here today who feel stuck in our relationship with God, who feel like our praying is boring, who feel like it's ineffective. Because when we pray, we can use our faith eyes to look back at the cross. Just start there. I don't know what to pray about. We'll start with gratitude for what Jesus has done for you. Start with thank you. (laughs) Start with thinking about what it cost him to go to the cross. Start with thinking about the weight of sin that has been removed from your life and you will find that gratitude rises up in you that God would do that for you, that he loves you that much, that he'd be willing to die in your place. When I think about Jesus Christ dying for me on the cross, it instantly reminds me of three things. How deeply God loves me, how costly evil and sin is, actually is, and how completely I'm forgiven. Start by looking back at the cross because that's the foundation for everything that flows from our praying of what Jesus has done for you and for me for the entire world. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 19, it says, For you know that God paid a ransom. He paid a ransom. He paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. How much do you think you're worth? Well, there's TV, whole TV shows about what things are worth. <laughs> Antique Roadshow, mate. Who likes that show? Some of you, far out, there's lots of fans in the room. You can watch it because it's all about this concept. People bring along something they think is a valuable possession for it to be appraised. And we might look at it and go, oh, that's hideous. <laughs> And an experienced valuer then says, I want to tell you how much it's worth. It's not what you think your mum thinks it's worth. It's not what your grandma told you it's worth. It's what I think people are willing to pay for it when it's auctioned. That's how much it's worth. And people get a bit of a rude shock or are pleasantly surprised. (laughs) Because it's not always what they think. If nobody's willing to pay for it, it's not worth anything. Well, how much are you worth? What was Jesus willing to pay for you? For you to know God as your heavenly father. 
That's how much you're worth to him. You're worth everything. You're worth his life. You're worth his precious blood. And so if you start at the cross, if you go back and you start to say, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that even though I've been trying to do it in my own strength this week, that you've done it all for me, that you've died on the cross for me, you've removed my sin as far as the east is from the west. Oh, how I thank you. How I thank you that you love me and you think I'm worth something, even though I don't feel worth something, that I feel like I failed you. But how grateful I am, Father, that you sent Jesus, that he died on that cross, that he took the weight of my sin and he was buried. But I thank you now that he's alive and he's living in me and I thank you that it's all because of what he's done and I'm just so grateful, God. When I think of how much Jesus loves me and how much I'm forgiven, it fills me with immense gratitude and joy. And it brings us back to we can't earn our salvation. We can't do enough to please God. We can't make ourselves good enough in his presence. It's all a free gift of grace based on Jesus. We can use our faith eyes to look back at the cross. And you know, music is so helpful with this. You might have heard a song that we sing on Sundays and you just think, I love that song because it talks about the cross. It talks about what Jesus has done for me. It actually reminds me of how much I'm worth to him and how much I'm forgiven. You don't just need a prayer list. Maybe you need a playlist. Like seriously, find some songs. Go to YouTube, go to Kurong, talk to Alyssa and Nathan or Tanya or someone on the team. Say, where is that song from? Tell me because I want to put it on repeat because it leads me to the cross. Maybe that's an application point for you this week. Get a playlist, put it on. Start with what Jesus has done on the cross as you start to pray in your time with the Lord. Right now, all of the sins you've ever committed, they're still in the past and so is the cross. <laughs> Jesus has already taken care of them because God loves you so much. If you're a follower of Christ, are you letting condemnation for past sins play over in your mind around and around and around? Flick them off in Jesus' name because he's already dealt with it on the cross. And if you've never accepted Jesus, the Bible says that to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's a simple matter of receiving this free gift that God offers you. It's not simple because it cost him everything. But it's not something you have to do. It's a gift you receive, Christ, into your life. And you can do that today. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever and he's multidimensional, all the sins you haven't yet committed have also been dealt with him. How good is that? Because you know, I don't want to sin, but there's some things that I know that I'm going to do, I'm going to slip up. Jesus has already paid for them. He's already got it covered. That is so freeing <laughs> and that's a game changer. Jesus took care of it all. He solved my problem before I even knew I had a problem. <laughs> and he did it for you too. We can use the eyes of our heart, our faith eyes, and we can look back at the cross. We can also, number two, look up <laughs> to our Father's face. We can look back to the cross. We can look up to our Father's face. God wants you to see and know him as Father. More than any other name that you call him, he wants you to call him Father. When Jesus said, this is how you should pray, he said, you should call God Father. Father. And we don't realise how mind-blowing this is because... Over thousands of years of the Old Testament, there was only one or two times where God was called Father. He was called Lord. He was called King of Kings, Lord of Lords, so many big names. He's called Creator. But with the arrival of Jesus, he makes it emphatically clear, I want 
God wants you to call him Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Do you call God Father when you pray? If you change one thing about your prayer life, change that. You know, we can start easily slip back into or start our prayers with, now Lord, now God. But what if you started this week, every prayer, every prayer with, now Father. I tell you what. God starts some healing deep on the inside when you start to even use his name like that. Because it brings up stuff about, well, my earthly father wasn't like that. So I don't know if I can call God that. Listen, your earthly father is not your God. Your God is not your earthly father. As good as your earthly father might have been, as horrible as your earthly father might have been, God is not your earthly father. He is caring, he's close, he's considerate, he's consistent, he's capable, he's utterly good. And he says to you, I love you. I've committed myself 100% to you on the cross. I've showed you, demonstrated my commitment to you. I want you to call me Father. And doing this can start a process of deep healing in your heart and your mind. Because you're reclaiming your identity as a child of God, first and foremost. Because you're saying how my earthly father treated me is not who I am. My heavenly father is. And how you see God affects everything. And he can start to just minister his love, his consistency, his care into your heart and life. Even just as you start to use that name, Father. Because that's where intimacy starts to grow. You see, God wants your and my prayers to be personal. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about we've not received a spirit that makes us slaves again to fear. We should not act like cowering, fearful slaves when we come to God because he's our father. We're adopted into his family. Instead, it says in Romans 8, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. For for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm we are God's children. And since we're his children, we're his his heirs. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And there's so much life-changing truth in this verse. If you know Jesus here today, you're not meant to act like a fearful slave in God's presence because that is not that is not who you are. You are his child. He is your father. And if you go to any Middle Eastern country right now, you will see little kids about the age of Sam and Tani's kids, Ari and Abby, running around calling their dad, Abba, 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 Abba. It means... Papa. It means daddy. It's not even the language of a seven year old or a nine year old. It's the language of a little toddler of complete trust. Abba, Papa, Daddy, Dada. Jesus says, when you come to God, call him Abba, Daddy. Abba is the most basic root word in the Aramaic language which Jesus spoke. And Jesus says, that's how you address God. What a picture of intimacy, hey? And trust. God wants intimacy with you. He created you for intimacy with him. And to grow in your intimacy with him, some of us need to change the way we talk to him, address him. 
because you're not talking to your tax accountant. Sorry if you're a tax accountant. You're not talking to a judge where you're so fearful you're going to say the wrong thing. You're not talking to your teacher where you have to put up your hand and ask for permission to go to the front office. You're talking to your daddy. When you pray, your prayers are not to be flowery and beautiful and cool. Your prayers are to be simple, childlike, unpretentious. When you pray, call God Father, call him Daddy, call him Papa, call him an intimate description of Father. Have you ever seen a toddler worrying about making a good impression? They just don't care. (laughs) God wants you to come to him like that. More than anything else, more than what you say, I want it to be personal. I'm your father, he says, so stop talking to me like I'm your boss or your recruiter. I'm your daddy. When you settle this issue, it will change the way you pray. Because every misunderstanding of prayer is a misunderstanding of God. Every misunderstanding of prayer is a misunderstanding of God. So start every prayer this week with Daddy or Papa or Father. Every prayer. Why? Because that's how God says he wants to be addressed by you. (laughs) And you might be thinking, I don't really feel comfortable doing that. Well, maybe that's the problem and why you feel stuck in your prayer life right now. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you give it a go this week. God wants your prayers to be personal and he wants them to be passionate. Thinking about a toddler again, have you noticed that they cry a lot? Sometimes when they're in public, they just have a complete meltdown. It's just time to cry, that's it. And as much as their parents might be embarrassed or inconvenienced by it, they don't care. They cry out because they need something or they feel frustrated or something's happened to thwart their desire for a lolly on the shelf. (laughs) Some of us need to get a little passionate in our prayers. We need to cry out. There's things that should make you frustrated. There's things that should make you mad. There's things that should drive you to your knees and say, Oh God, oh Father, would you move in this situation? Because if you don't, this is disastrous. Oh, Father, oh, Daddy, I need your help because I don't know what to do. I don't know what, I seriously don't know what to do. I'm stuck. Help me. Go for a long walk on the beach. Cry out to God. Get on your knees at home. Sometimes I remember and I've been in my car and I'm just driving, trying to concentrate, okay? So make sure you concentrate. But just, you know, it's like this heart cry out to God. I need God, I don't know what to do. I need your help. I've got to have you come through in this way. I can't pay the bills. You know, there's things. I'm not saying that I've always prayed that. Don't worry. It's okay. (laughs) I might have prayed that sometimes. But there's things that, you, you know, that we cry out to him about. And God wants our prayers to be a partnership with him because the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We don't know sometimes what to pray, how to pray, what to say. i got no words, God. I'm just going to come and check in and sit here in your presence because I know that you care for me and you care for this situation and I'm just going to sit here. And that's where that beautiful gift of baptism in the Holy Spirit helps us because we just start to use that beautiful prayer language. The Bible says that the Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with God's will. He himself prays through us through, with groanings. And so prayers are personal. They're passionate. God wants them to be a partnership. You can look up into your father's face this week. Look back at the cross. Look up into his face. You can also look inward to Jesus within you. Christ actually lives in you. <laughs> 
And when he comes to live in you, you're very, you start to become very aware that there's some stuff in there with him that you don't like. There's some stuff, it might be attitudes, it might be secret sins, it might be uh, just things that cause you to be distracted from him, it might be your own fears or some compulsions, some hurtful memories. There's stuff in us that we're very aware, not only we don't like, we think, hmm, I'm not sure if this is helping me become more like you, Jesus. <laughs> and so when Jesus comes to live on the inside of us, we can start to pray and ask him to help us do some house cleaning. We have to be honest. We can't be honest if we think we're going to get in trouble. But if we look up into our Father's face and know that he accepts us unconditionally, then we're free to say, now, Jesus, would you help me with this? Would you help me with this? <laughs> There's a great prayer you can pray from Psalm 139. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Do you know God already knows what you need to work on? He's never going to say, I didn't see that one coming, Cass. Scratching my head on how to help you with that one. He knows. He knows. You can ask him for help. You can start with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's a good place to start. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Because when you look at all those descriptions, love what, of what uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, when you see them, you see, I'm not some of those things, but I want to be those things because when I see those things, that's who Jesus is. So you can start to ask him, God, would you grow some patience in me this week? God, would you, you help me with self-control? I've been, I really know that there's been areas of lack of self-control in my life. Would you, would you help me with self-control this week? Would you grow some in my life? We can pray, Jesus, you're in me. Show me what needs to change. Start producing some fruit in my life today. Help me be a little bit more loving, a little bit more joyful, a little bit more at peace. Produce some fruit in me today. So we can look back to the cross. We can look up to our Father's face. We can look inward to Jesus within. We can also start to pray as we look around to people in need. We can look around. We can think about our day and say, who needs some help today? <laughs> the most dangerous prayer that you can pray is use me because God actually will answer it. I dare you to pray it. Some of you already pray it. I dare you to pray it in deeper ways. Use me, God. Use me any way that you want to use me. Mother Teresa said, stop trying to do some, something great with your life. Just do normal things with a great amount of love and God will bless that. Romans 6.13 says, Give yourself completely to God, every part of you, since you've been given a new life and you want to be used as a tool in the hands of God, used for his good purposes. When your passion or your air of interest or your availability meets a need, you have a match. And God wants to answer some people's prayer through you. Lastly, we can look forward to our future. We can look back to the cross. We can look up into our Father's face. We can look inward to Jesus. We can pray and look around us to people in need. And lastly, as we pray, we can look forward to our future. As you pray, you might start to then say, Lord, I've got 19 or 199 things to do today. <laughs> I have no idea how that's all going to happen. Father, I need your help. Would you bring someone along my path who can help me? Or would you help me prioritise to do the things you want me to do? You can talk to God about your 
your day, your schedule, your week, your month, your year, your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, your 20-year plan, your life goal. God wants to hear about your dreams and your passions and things that you want to see happen in the future. He wants to hear about those things. You can talk to him about those things. But I'm finished with this. (laughs) Ultimately, as God's father... Ultimately, as God is your father and you are his child, you can know that he's rigged, already rigged the system. You're not going to get everything you want in life. (laughs) But God wired you and made you and what he wants to accomplish through you, what he wants you to be in your life, it's already been started. He's begun it and he's promised he would continue it on. He's promised that he will accomplish it in your life. How good is that? In Philippians 1 verse 6, it says, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, until the time of his return. It's not dependent on you. You can cooperate with him, but what a relief, what a joy, what a promise, what an assurance that what he's begun in you, he is committed to carrying on and completing. That is so good. He will be faithful to complete it. He's promised he'll do it and he's 100% lovingly committed to you. As you pray, as you freshen up your prayer life, Maybe that's a pattern for you. I would encourage you to use it this week. Look back. Start with the cross. Look up into your father's face. Call him father. Look within. Say, Jesus, search me. Is there something in me that you want me to reconcile and make right? Look around. What needs are around you? Pray about them. (laughs) Ask God to use you in those situations. Maybe there's an idea for a a ministry area or a new business venture or something that God will put in your heart as you begin to pray, use me. You know, God knew the world needed a little bit of Lynn Sanders. So he made you, Lynn, and you're awesome. God knew the world needed something from Kelly Nesbitt. So he said, oh, I've just got just the person picked out. There's no one with your DNA, with your personality, with your spiritual gifts, with your fingerprint. God decided the world needs a bit of Helen Hordehart, what a champion she is. So he designed you and lovingly made you. And he could say that about each one of us. So awesome. We're going to pray together and then we're going to come around the Lord's table. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today to us. I just had a real sense as I was preparing for this message that today's word is going to be and is a launching pad for so many of us into a greater level of intimacy with you into stepping into some dreams and visions you have for our life and the way you want to use us, into a deeper understanding of what it cost you and how much we're worth to you, into a renovation, a house cleaning of some attitudes and things on the inside that we can hand over to you. Thank you, Lord. So just as the ushers hand out the emblems right now, as we take these elements, it is going to symbolise what Jesus has done for us. We share in communion with him and as believers with one another. If you have never put your trust in Jesus... This is your moment you can do it. You can receive his free offer of forgiveness. (laughs) He's 
His free offer of forgiveness is so good. His free offer of eternal life. But most importantly, his free offer of knowing him as your heavenly father. You can come to him today because Jesus has done everything necessary to pay the price, to pay the ransom for you. You can believe upon him and invite him to lead your life.